One of the greatest <coughs> of Oriental artists was the Japanese painter and woodblock designer, Hokusai. There was a brief article about him not long ago in the Reader's Digest, in which it described him under a name he gave himself, the old man mad with drawing. Hokusai lived to be approximately 90 years old. And during practically his entire lifetime, he dedicated every moment of his waking time to drawing and painting. He became a genius of such extraordinary merit that he has gained worldwide recognition and has exercised a very considerable influence upon Western art. Hokusai was regarded as an eccentric in his own time but because he rather abused a common practice among Japanese intellectuals. When an artist or a musician or a writer or a poet developed a new style or seemed to make a step of new growth within his own nature, he gathered his friends about him, sent out a formal invitation, in the form of a delicately designed ceremonial, a little picture, and took this occasion to formally announce his change of name. Because whenever he did something new or important or different, he had a new name. Uh, because he was no longer that old person anymore. He was now the new person. Of course, Hokusai lived a long time, but it's considered that he was rather generous in this procedure, as he is believed to have changed his name over 90 times. <clears throat> this was considered somewhat irregular, even among his own friends. But he went blissfully along, producing art under so many names that it is probable that some of the uh, pieces will never be with certainty identified. But a study of his work shows that each time he changed his name, something happened in the thing he was doing. It was not arbitrary. It represented a new birth in himself. And a new birth means a new person. And a new person means, in a mysterious way, release from the limitations of the old person who no longer exists. There can be no new person without this release. And one of the things that each individual has to release in order to become a new person is his own past. He cannot cling to the attitudes and ideas, to the beliefs and policies, to the standard of living and thinking, which have belonged to some previous name or personality. Now, this peculiar practice was not limited to, limited to Japan. We find in Egypt, the reference to new names. We know that in the Greek and Egyptian mystery rituals, those who passed the initiation test were given new names. We know that among the American Indians, the child growing into maturity, taking the tests of his tribe, was given a new name. And in the book of Revelation, there is described a white stone upon which a name is inscribed that shall be given to the one who overcomes the world. This new name is a new self. And this philosophy, while it occurs in many countries, is perhaps closer to the Buddhistic philosophy than it is to the religions of some other peoples. Because in Buddhism, there is no recognition of a continuous, unchanging personality from the cradle to the grave. It is true that when we look in the mirror, there may be certain continuing resemblance. But the Oriental is not as much concerned with what he sees in the mirror as what he knows in his own heart. And as this heart changes, these changes, if they are real, these will result in the establishment of a new personality. In Buddhism, the personality of man is in continual motion. Therefore, the individual at 40 is not the same person that he was at 20. 
if by some peculiarity of temperament he would seem to be the same person, this is not an achievement, this is a loss. The person who remains the same is the person who has not succeeded, who has not achieved the primary purpose for life, and that is the continual, continual outgrowing of old selves, which are left behind like the shells on the seashore. The important thing is to outgrow the self as we know it. And by this continually becoming more, to achieve constantly to a new self. Now, a new self is not primarily a new attitude. It is not a new intellectual attachment. It is not a person joining one thing or departing from something else. A new self is an interior transformation. And it is the purpose of philosophy and religion that this transformation process shall be continuously progressive, forward, upward, and better. The individual who by circumstances appears to change for the worse, who seems to be less at his end than at his beginning, has therefore lost most of the meaning and significance of the great process of growth. He also suffers, as do those who grow too slowly, from the continual loss of adjustment between the individual and the society around him. He is only contemporary if he continues to grow. Now, we may say that the contemporary way of things is not always good. And therefore, adjustment to it is not always desirable. These statements are true. But the ability to understand it, to understand now, to be able to consciously experience now whether to accept or not to accept, this ability is important. But without it, we suffer needless pain. Without it, we have no way of orienting ourselves. We lose sight of natural integrity. We begin to wonder if the universe is going wrong. We wonder why things seem to move by and leave us behind. And gradually, if we are left behind, we crystallize, lose the power of individual action. Thus, it is important that each individual has the experience, not necessarily of changing his physical name, but its equivalent, of so changing himself that he might be regarded as a different person, and therefore might be entitled to a new name. Perhaps the Oriental policy is not so bad, because we gradually make an identification with our name. It can become a terrible block to our progress. If the name is Smith, and we must spend our lives being true to Smith, we are in a very bad way. If, however, we recognize that Smith was a name perhaps we were born with, or a name perhaps with which we grew up and became intimately associated, but that that Smith does not stand or for or represent a static being who will always be Smith, it stands for a dynamic a symbol that must ever change. And we must either change the name or else change the identity with which we recognize the name or change the person with whom the name is associated. And if the name remains the same, sometimes perhaps it is a little harder for us to escape an old identity. So the elaborate ceremony of simply discarding a name uh, is not always... Is, uh, so wrong or so lacking perhaps in psychological importance to ourselves. If the name is Smith, we may blame that Smith in us for things we did long ago. But if that Smith is no more and we have a new person and a new being, perhaps it will help us to escape into the future and depart from these old ties that have bound us to a crystallized concept or pattern. Now, of course, among these Japanese artists, it was not uncommon for a master to bestow one of his old names upon a favorite disciple. Now, this might be an interesting procedure also. This was another type of very subtle reminder that the disciple has taken on the name of his master. 
The disciple, very carefully, methodically, following his master's instruction, is no longer himself. He is gradually a little shadow of the master. Therefore, perhaps, as the master grows on, he leaves his old name to the disciple who has earned it. And, to use the argo of our day, may be stuck with it. <laughs> now, the disciple, being part of this common tradition, is tremendously honored uh, by uh, receiving this name. Sometimes we are quite flattered uh, when some honorable name is associated with our own. We think it's wonderful if someone suspects us of having some of the attributes of Abraham Lincoln. We feel that nothing would be a greater compliment. In a way, this is true. But also the artist who receives the cast-off name of his master, like an old coat, is proud when he receives it, and he goes faithfully along his way, doing what the master taught him, drawing like the master, painting like the master, writing poems that sound so much like the masters that the only difference is that the disciples probably are not quite so meritorious. And then after a while, the disciple begins to realize that he is a being, a person, that he is something in himself, that he is more than merely a shadow. So in due time, he comes to the conclusion that he has certain attitudes and attributes of his own. Therefore, he will attempt to branch out. He will introduce innovations into the old pattern that was given to him. He proceeds to try to escape from influence into self-expression. And if he achieves this desirable end, then he also gathers his friends, sends out his suramono, and announces a change of his own name. He is now going to be himself. It's a pretty little ceremony. And it also has a very rich value if we begin to estimate, as Hoxai himself said, that it is terrible to die a slave to the reputation of a name. But sometimes, somewhere, this name was important. We can never forget it, whether we remain important or not. If its purposes are completed, if its services have been rendered, then release it and have a new name, and go on to new things, but do not bind them with the old. This thinking opens a very interesting area of thought, which has a direct bearing upon the problem of our book, namely the vital value of the individual attaining a degree of consciousness or a, an integration of consciousness by means of which he is suddenly liberated from his own past, from his own insufficiency, and also perhaps from certain associations which he has come to regard with too much fondness. He needs, we all need, freedom. And the purpose of our realizations is to achieve this freedom from the limitation of the past. Naturally, we are going forward, Naturally, we will enter new conditions of limitation, because as veil upon veil we lift, we find veil upon veil behind. But always this advancement is into a larger area of consciousness, more achievement. Something is added by which we become new beings under the sun. And by this newness, we mark our progress. For this progress is an ever newness in ourselves. Our most perfect and successful uh, means of overcoming such problems as the traditional problem of age, in which the folks I always believed a new name was a new birth. He was a baby again, starting out in a new universe. And even to the very last years of his life, he lived in a world of tomorrow, of things forever new and only wish that he might add a few more years to his life so that he could become as great as he longed to be. This ever-newness, therefore, is an escape from a whole group of psychological restrictions by means of which we very often limit our own ability to grow. 
This newness brings to us the very key to our realization problem. Uh, the Bible speaks of the time when all things shall be new. And this is the moment of personal growth. Growth is this forever becoming new. A very difficult thing to explain, for it can only be known through experience. It must be felt. It must be inwardly experienced. And not long ago, I was uh, reading an old commentary relating to the yogas. found a rather interesting uh, thought bearing upon this particular subject. It had to do with the idea that through the disciplines of yoga, certain controls of the body could be affected. Uh, certain abilities latent in the ordinary person could be intensified. It was quite conceivable that certain extrasensory perceptions could be stimulated. All these could result also in the gradual recognition that the yoga, that the yogic practice had produced a great soul, a being uh, superior to the average person in his power of mind over body and emotion. The great question, as this particular uh, author pointed out, however, is this. In what way is the consciousness of this man changed? Does he think with the same mind? Does he feel with the same emotions? Has this change that he has wrought actually changed him to the bone? to the innermost part of his own nature? Is he opening new eyes to look at a new world? Or is he merely intensifying certain faculties and skills and gaining the magician's control over certain rudimentary elements of nature? If this person is not deeply and wonderfully and miraculously changed, then the so-called exercises or disciplines have really achieved little, if anything. And uh, Buddha tells us how we shall recognize essential change. Inasmuch as this change, coming as it must from within, becomes like a radiant center, touching and unfolding all of the faculties and powers of the nature, releasing these through the miracle of the transcendent being, so that the person who is really changed from within, in the direction of the newer and the better, will always be able to note this change, and others will note it, in the simple and direct improvement of his own character. There can be no growth which does not result in the gradual unfoldment of virtues and the gradual falling away of vices. There is no growth that is important that does not make the person bigger in relationship to problem. If he cannot solve things better than he did before, the so-called achievement is either merely intellectual or physiological. If the person having attained a larger insight is not able to express this largeness through patience, through kindness, through understanding and sympathy, through tolerance, through the correction of excessive attitudes, if this person is not a better friend, a better parent, a better husband or wife, or a better child, then these disciplines have failed. We also know that subtle factors gradually insinuate themselves into the spiritual ambitions of many people, and that these ambitions often take over, and the individual's aim is to excel others rather than to unfold himself. His ambitions may cause him to direct his energies and endeavors towards certain specific ends which he himself desires. 
And by these ambitions, the natural newness of his nature is locked by the old habits and the old attitudes which he has not changed. If a person moving from one degree of understanding to another retains all the pressures of the older viewpoint, then he has not really changed. He has not really grown. And no amount of intellection, no amount of scholarship, no amount of magical power can in any way compensate for the simple process of changing. This changing which results from the person's understanding of life deepening as a result of the growth he is attaining. So self-unfoldment is really this continual unfoldment of value, so clearly set that there can be no doubt that the person who has proceeded along the path is warmer and richer in those virtues which we all recognize to be right and therefore that this person is more enjoyable, more companionable, uh, richer and deeper in sympathy and understanding. These are the tests, these are the points uh, which make the new person. The new person is not one who has simply intellectualized himself out of a previous mood. He's a person with a new mood, a new nature, a new being, rejoicing in its escape from some ancient bondage, so that man must forever escape from the bondage of his own past, his own old ideas, his own well-set habits, the traditions which have crowded and cramped him through the years, the ambitions which have led him in one degree of life will not be sufficient to lead him in the next. If these do not change, he is not changing. And if he is not changing, he is not growing. These points are not emphasized as they should be. And therefore, we have a great many uh, people striving very hard, trying their best to grow, but unable to do so successfully, so that they know a little more than they did but they are not more in themselves than they were. And out of this, uh, we have a very sad delay in the natural tempo of growth. The difference, of course, is that we can change our opinions as a result of contacts with others, but we become new beings as a result of release from within ourselves. This is the important element in growth. Now, I want to bring up a few special points that we have marked here in the book, which I think will have some bearing upon the points we want to make, and I hope they'll help you. You know the material that we are covering this evening will be derived from chapters 8, 9, and 10. A number of the friends have told me that they have been reading and studying the book as they went along, and I think this will help because, naturally, it would be of very little value for me to simply read the book to you. The point is to try to bring in uh, new uh, levels of thinking, new symbols, new incentives to the particular end uh, which we seek to achieve. Uh, in uh, the eighth chapter, under the heading of motive, we have a line in italics. And this line is something that could be read over rather quickly and passed on. Uh, but that would, I think, uh, be a mistake, because perhaps it is one of the most important statements in the entire book. It arises from a mention of the Rose Garden of Sardi, which is one of the great mystical works of the Sufis. And in this uh, uh, context, I insert the following statement. The Rose Garden is for the one who loves the roses. Now this is uh, so extraordinarily simple that I, I wonder if everyone has given it the attention they should. Because perhaps it is the key uh, to the entire practice of realization and the entire path of self-unfoldment. In uh, Sardi, the rose garden, 
becomes the symbol of the illumined life. It becomes an emblem of man's internal awareness. It is the secret garden, the garden of virtue and value, in which he is establishing in his own consciousness. And in this problem of the rose garden, each individual becomes the gardener in this mystic garden of his own soul. Now, if you have a garden of your own, somewhere out back or in front, or on a windowsill, or perhaps if you lived many years in New York, that proverbial rubber plant on the fire escape, but whatever you may have, the problem of the garden is important. You go and you talk to people who have gardens, and you say, why? One individual will say, well, my neighbor has one, uh, and, they, and they look rather good out in front, you know, and also if they grow up enough, they won't have to paint the house so often. You can get all kinds of recommendations. One of the classic answers to any penetrating question in the United States is a slurred, I don't know. Uh, this seems to, uh, to imply a completely negative attitude. The individual is just doing it. Another person is raising flowers because he's a member of the garden club. And that year they're going to exhibit roses and he's hoping to take the first prize. This uh, can cause him a great deal of uh, concentration and also a great deal of sorrow if his pet rose doesn't hold up until the proper day. Another individual is uh, taking up gardening at his doctor's suggestion. He needs more outdoor exercise. Another one is attempting to use a garden as a means of uh, getting a certain amount of emotional release. They're a little frustrated, you know. Uh, they, they don't have very much creative expression. Then there's always that uh, health expert who does it because of the vibrations from the earth. You can have almost anything you want as an answer to why you don't have a garden. But the old Persian mystics took the attitude that the only person who really has a garden is the one who simply loves the roses. That's all. If you are doing this for any reason, except that it tells something about your own consciousness, you are doing it for some reason that is not fully worthy. And in the growth of the individual, the development of the garden of his inner life, this is peculiarly and importantly true. The individual who is growing to outgrow pain is failing. The individual who is growing competitively is failing. The one who is seeking to unfold greater power so that he may be more successful in some way is more or less failing. And the person who believes that consciousness will enable him to bear the weight of an unfortunate bargain is also a failing in his purposes. Every ulterior motive is essentially and basically wrong. Now, I know that ulterior motives today are very difficult to escape, and sometimes, to a limited degree, they are necessary. We take a person under a very severe psychic stress or psychic tension, and we give this individual escapes. We give him or try to find for him mechanisms by means of which he will be able to achieve self-expression on a non-dangerous level. We say to the individual, find yourself avocational outlets, find new interests, plant a garden. We may even suggest to him that this is a good way for him to counteract certain pressures in his own life. But this is to be understood in the same way that we recommend exercise or diet. It is the same as recommending a remedy. This is on the level of medication. This is on the level of an effort to achieve a scientific um, compensation for a recognized physical problem. This particular phase of our subject does not essentially belong under the heading of religion. This is not a philosophical uh, end, merely an effort to correct a condition temporarily or in part 
so as to prevent a serious crisis from arising in the life of the individual. But when we go beyond our human problem, when we, be go, when we try to surmount the obstacle of personality by a direct de dedication or devotion to principles, then we can no longer regard our autocorrective procedures as therapeutic or as merely being evasions or avoidances. If we continue to take this attitude, uh, we find that the garden ultimately becomes no help to us. It gives us a little help for a time, but it solves nothing. There is only one end by which the garden can ha really help permanently. And that is that gradually the therapy will change into a true and honest admiration and devotion. That the person having been introduced to something that previously perhaps he had not considered, may, as he becomes more familiar with the subject, become personally aware of the value. Not value in terms of consequence, but value in terms of essence. But out of this new experience, there is something that makes him a better person. This is the experience that he must seek. And he must not seek it intentionally. It must be something that more or less comes to him, something that he awakens to by the natural processes of growth. But the real purpose always is the direct and factual purpose the purpose of doing the thing for its own sake and not for the sake of some expected or hoped for reward or consequence that is unusual. In life, the great artist is simply the one who loves art. The great musician is the one who loves music. This true fondness inspiring the individual to attain the discipline proficiency necessary not because he wishes to be recognized, but because he wishes to be true to a beauty beyond himself. Thus growth uh, in the terms of the service of beauty becomes a rather humble desire to be worthy, not of some recognition, but of the very beauty he serves. And by degrees, if this truer and deeper motive takes over, then gradually love becomes unselfish. It becomes a simple, natural, childlike gesture of protecting that which is good, of serving that which is beautiful, and of loving that which in its own nature is deserving of love. These are the simple and direct things. And growth is away from circuitous and mysterious courses into very simple and direct actions. Actions which have no ulterior motive, have no mystery in them at all, have no need to be explained as we try to explain things. The simple fact is that we move because we are impelled to move. And we are impelled by the best of ourselves. Therefore, our motion is toward the best for ourselves. In this simple concept, therefore, growth is really for those who love truth. Wisdom is, though, is for those who love wisdom. It is not that a man desires to be wise, but that he loves wisdom and he serves it. And all the so-called advancements that he may make are incidental byproducts that he does not even pause to consider. If he makes these byproducts too important, he will never attain the main product. So in all growth, we must simplify all ulterior motives. We must do things simply and entirely for their own sake. We do them because we know they need doing. We take a certain responsibility because that responsibility should be taken. We advance as far as we can noble causes because they are noble causes. And not because we hope that some way, sometime, 
there will be an ulterior benefit to ourselves. Selfishness is one of the most subtle and most dangerous of all motives. And whoever is captured in it, as he goes further into the mysteries of the invisible life of man, will be in ever greater danger. Man has certain interior faculties and perceptions that are beginning to be understood better than they were as a result of psychological research. Psychology has clearly answered many mystical questions of the past for which no um, rationally scientific explanation has previously been available. In the study, therefore, of psychological problems today, we are beginning to recognize the dynamic of motive. We are beginning to realize that the confusion that arises in the human psyche is traceable to large degree to uncertain motive. That where in the secretness of himself, the individual is compromising his principles, or is selling out, or is trying to do good things for reasons that are not good, or is inconsistent with convictions which he holds to be valid and true, or in looking at himself cannot be reasonably satisfied with the consistency of his own action, that believing certain things he does those things. If he cannot find this kind of satisfaction, and observes instead a confused uh, interior nature, he will also be rapidly on the way to create these complexes and frustrations and neurotic symptoms which we now associate with psychological tension. If he goes on with this kind of a psychological inner life and gradually attempts to investigate or explore the rarefied dimensions of higher spiritual and mystical space, he is in serious danger of personal delusion. In fact, it is impossible for him to avoid it. He cannot judge the unknown except by means of his own internal resources. And if these resources have been compromised or corrupted, his judgment cannot be sound. And of course, we realize now that visions and trances and all kinds of mysterious circumstances, once regarded as almost entirely religious, are now known to be almost entirely intellectual emotional. Therefore, the vision cannot be trusted. If the person who has it has no solid integrity in himself. The unbalanced, uncertain person cannot have a balanced and certain vision. The individual whose inner nature is not reasonably well integrated cannot have a purposeful and meaningful mystical experience. If he is not well balanced, what he calls a mystical experience is merely a kind of symbolic diagnosis of his own mistakes. In other words, what he terms his mystical experience is really a kind of testimony to what is wrong with him, instead of being the proof that he has now transcended all limitations of the flesh and is sailing off into some distant nirvanic region. It is perfectly possible for a psychotic experience, one which tells us that we are sick, to be in its earlier stages attractive. It is not necessary for us to have some horrible experience in order that we may be deluded. Delusion may be of many kinds, and as man's personal habits and interests and inclinations differ, so his symbolic reactions may take a variety of shapes and likenesses. But essentially, the individual looking into the infinite must use the interior faculties that he has developed within his consciousness to see 
that which is not ordinarily visible. If he is internally poorly integrated, that which he sees can only be the shadow of his own imperfect vision. So that motive becomes exceedingly important. For a wrong motive throws fantasy into the situation. It opens the person to spiritual hallucination. It makes it almost inevitable that any experience which seems to transcend the normal must be illusionary. Because if the person has not transcended certain limitations within himself, he cannot honestly experience beyond those limitations in a valid manner. What appears to be a great enlightenment imposed upon an uncertain virtue is really some form of psychological symbolism. The person to see, to know, to understand must have this tremendous directness, this simplicity and integrity of viewpoint. He must cultivate the rose of illumination simply because he loves roses. He cannot have any other motive. Now, motives are very touchy and uh, mysterious things and become very definitely involved. I've had many people come to me with what they regarded as completely pure motives. They honestly believed that they were the most unselfish, dedicated mortals that ever trod this forlorn planet. Actually, however, it wasn't true. This indiv one individual will say, well, I have no interest in the world except to give my life to the service of something better than I am. It's a wonderful speech, but it doesn't mean anything. And time proved that it didn't. The individual was really loaded with ulterior motives. And analysis would prove very clearly that this person never having had an opportunity uh, to lead and having a frustrated superiority complex was very hopeful of being able to take it out upon the world by giving their life in the unselfish dissemination of their own ideas to gain a certain satisfaction from having saved other people. This can be one of the most triumphant ulterior motives that there is. And yet the person would not believe it and will not believe it until he has tried his experiment and found that instead of saving, he hurt. Instead of solving, he complicated. And so finally, he has to admit that he is not quite able to take over the management of the cosmos. This uh, situation is repeated on every level of human endeavor. The human being cannot escape the pressures of his inward tempers. He cannot escape his heredity. He cannot escape his own childhood. He cannot escape the limitations of the experiences which have made his life painful or disagreeable. He cannot escape from any of these things except by one simple inevitable action. And that is the straight motion toward identity by the simple direction of serving that which is next. In other words, the person must become totally without self motive. And it is only in this condition that universal motive can take over. And the person who tries to condition universal motive, who tries to say how God should act and upon whom, is placing himself in a very dangerous relationship with the infinite. So that uh, all these growth procedures have to be with complete simple sincerity and directness. And the person must certainly, in the early stages of his questing, guard continuously against the intrusion of himself into the patterns 
which he is trying to build. If this self continues to intrude, he can never outgrow himself. He is locked within a kind of squirrel cage. He can spin the wheel continuously, but he gets nowhere. He can only escape by complete relaxation of self-purpose. Now, in our Western way of life, there are many experts that don't quite think that this is the way it ought to be done. They feel that the individual who loses a certain self-persuasive dynamic, who doesn't force his own way, is not going to get very far. That he will never be the success that he could be if he would simply blow his own horn a little louder. So today, uh, the tendency is for the person to try to force his personality upon himself and upon others. If he fails to do this, it is held that he will be lost in the shuffle of life, that others will take over uh, and will achieve, and he will be left sitting under a tree somewhere in abstract contemplation of remote infinites. The people who say this, however, have never been anywhere themselves. The individual who states that this type of direct thought action, which is recommended in our book, that the, who say that this will lead to stagnation, are simply theoretically attempting to defend their own position. Here again, self-interest rather than honest criticism is guiding them. Most persons resent in others a condition of integration which they themselves lack. Many persons are desperately afraid that this world is not a struggle. Because if it is not a struggle, then they've wasted a long time struggling, and that's a hard thought to accept. To wake up someday and find that this world is not a fight is going to be most discouraging. And people might wonder what they've been doing all these years and why they did it. Actually, the type of aggressiveness with which we now associate the successful person, the type of attitude that the college professor recommends or the young uh, business executive is indoctrinated with, these types of attitudes have actually never led anywhere. They have never accomplished anything beyond a certain immediate pressurefulness. Now, in the old days, you remember, when they used to have heavy, massive horses attached to great trucks, and these horses thundered along the cobblestone streets, drawing immense weights behind them. Sometimes these horses would reach a hill. They couldn't quite make the top of it. Then the driver with a whip beat them furiously for no good reason. The horses struggled. Sometimes they fell. Sometimes, under the lash, they made the top of the hill. This whipping, however, has only one essential end, the death of the horse. And the individual who tries to go over the hill by whipping himself, or using a psychology of whipping, ultimately defeats himself. Because he is forcing a situation which cannot be maintained because it is essentially contrary to nature and natural law. Every so often in history, we come upon a person who has peculiarly exemplified the virtues to which we refer. This person is recognized, perhaps as among the greatest of all mortals. Certainly the tremendous integrity of the man who said, Love thine enemies, and do good to them that despitefully use you. This man stands as perhaps one of the greatest human beings of all time. The successful, the rich, and the proud have all been forgotten. 
But he goes on, still stating simple truth, a simple and direct way of life. And men must suffer from their wars and their crimes and their miseries until they find out what he meant and live accordingly. Therefore, it is a mistake to assume that the way of true life is a way of negation or a way of uselessness or a way of failure. It is not. Simple and direct action is the way of success, not only in spiritual matters, but when properly performed, without ulterior motive, but simply because it is right, this same procedure of direct action becomes man's greatest protection in the material world, conserving his resources, strengthening his energies, and making him comparatively non-corruptible in a time when perhaps uh, the true values which he has are more needed than he realizes. It is only when the facts are obscured by emotion and thought, or when the individual claiming direct action or claiming virtue is at the same time exhibiting qualities which are not right, thereby losing the support of example, only then will he be likely to be in trouble. Actually, the simple procedure of direct motion, of simple uh, understanding, moving from within with a minimum of effort, a minimum of exhaustion or extension of energy, the individual moving surely, without doubt, without uncertainty, without confusion, achieves the most with the least wear and tear upon his own resources. Thus, the so-called meditative life, which is not a, con a condition of sitting around a meditation from morning to night, but a life in which all things move quietly from the inside, and by their very quietude become capable of an immense penetration, by their very quietude causing things to be well done, thoroughly done, removing the waste and the loss that comes from thoughtless conduct. The individual moves forward rapidly, but he moves quietly, peacefully, and the principal inspiration of his motion is simply that this is next, this is necessary, this is good. And by gradually eliminating himself and becoming merely the instrument of the action that is immediately needed, the person gains an extraordinary inner strength and also begins to sense the higher meaning of the meditational uh, disciplines and arts. So we can uh, also pass to another element of the story which is contained in the section also dealing, uh, following motive and called in the book here, The Fable of the Birds. I'm not going to give you the fable because you could read it yourself, but there is something in connection with the section which is a, a somewhat based upon one of Buddha's dialogues, which I think is also important to us. Uh, Buddha wrote in a number of instances in a very curious way in which he makes two statements that apparently oppose each other in the means of answering a direct question. I uh, took cer certain elements from one of these discourses and gathered them together here, uh, relating uh, to ways in which the experience of truth or the experience of truth knowing or inward uh, apperceiving can be destroyed. By destroyed, of course, we don't mean the truth can be destroyed, but we mean that a peculiar condition within the individual, which might be a channel for an interior strength or an interior extension, is broken up, fragmented by attitudes. And as Buddha points out, nearly all attitudes 
when they achieve a certain dogmatic place in the mind, become slayers of the real. Almost any attitude, as the Zen points out, that affirms this or that, in some mysterious way destroys truth by affirmation. Because if we say a thing is a certain way, then we must deny that it is any other way. And we fall into this either-or classification of Aristotle's. And this classification, while apparently highly reasonable, is in most cases destructive for the simple reason that according to Buddhist thinking, reality alone knows itself. Therefore, the individual attempting to dogmatize upon it is always in trouble. That which is can be defined only by its own nature. And when that which has not achieved that nature defines or attempts to define that which it has not achieved, delusion is the inevitable result. Now, delusion may be merely fooling oneself, or delusion may be the blocking of the avenues of the unaccepted. It is true that we can take light and break it through a prism into an elaborate spectrum, and we may state extraordinary fondness for one of the radiant colors in that spectrum. And we may take any one of those colors and say, this color is light, or this is the true color of light. But unless we are able to go beyond the spectrum and discover the one light from which all these colors come, we are not in true possession of the mystery of light or of color. Thus, we have to be extremely careful that we do not get into certain difficulties. And I have attempted to indicate these difficulties in a paragraph here from which I will read a few lines and then we will discuss it. Student number one destroys truth by declaring that one must practice yoga to discover it. Student number two destroys truth by affirming that he can discover the real through the intensive study of chemistry. Student number three destroys truth by taking mathematics as the key to universal knowledge. Student number four destroys truth by maintaining that it can be discovered by the practice of the austerities. Student number five destroys truth by insisting that reality can be achieved through pilgrimage. Student number six destroys truth by declaring that understanding can be won through contact with holy relics. Student number seven destroys truth by maintaining that it can be discovered in books. And student number eight destroys truth by declaring that it cannot be discovered in books. Now, the the point that Buddha tells us, of course, is this. Uh, Buddha says uh, that man blocks himself by saying, uh, by uh, studying the teachings of the Buddha, I shall achieve nirvana. He is wrong. Another man says, by not studying the teachings of the Buddha, I shall achieve nirvana. He is wrong. The point that is underlying all of these things is not that mathematics won't help. Many great souls have gone far by mathematics, but the experience that they achieved was accidental to them. In other words, they had not cultivated mathematics for that purpose. But through the cultivation of mathematics for its own sake, they had discovered something. Therefore, it is not the study, but the affirmation of the relation of the study to the result that becomes the secret of the disaster. It is the person trusting his spiritual destiny to his own decision or by attempting through some familiar line of thought by which he is more acquainted with one form of knowledge than another to declare that by has no set 
idea of his own. He is to serve truth, not to define it. When he defines it, he defiles it. Therefore, he cannot say this road leads to it or that road leads to it. And this was the same burden that Jesus had against the Pharisees and the Sadducees, namely that they regarded themselves as peculiarly qualified in spiritual matters. And Jesus called them hypocrites. Because the individual who sets up his own standard denies the right of the universe to establish true standard. And of course, the universe fails to notice this slight indiscretion and continues to exercise its own standard. And the individual finds himself locked in conflict with reality instead of moving toward it. Reality is not to be discovered as the expected. It is to be experienced as it is as a wonder unknown that cometh in the night, and the time or the hour no man knoweth. Therefore, we cannot say, when I have achieved this, I have truth. If I study that, I shall be enlightened. If I follow this master, I shall be uh, illumined. It might happen from any one of those causes, but the moment he, anyone says, by this it will happen. Some very subtle law of spiritual value is destroyed. And these subtle laws become more real than the grosser laws we know when we begin to function in a very attenuated and subtle sphere of consciousness. So it is not that Buddha uh, intends for us to imply a total disregard for this or total disregard for that, but rather to take the same attitude that he took with the Brahmins. If a wise man says there is a God, I agree with him. If the wise man says there is no God, I agree with him. Because actually, the moment we lock ourselves in disagreement with the wise man, we become about as stupid as any human being can be because we can only do this on one assumption that we know more than he does. And we end up by trying to affirm that we know more than God does. And this always ends in embarrassment. <laughs> Therefore, we cannot, with the faculties that we possess, say this or that. All we can do is to seek, to seek with everything we have for the good that surpasseth understanding. And if we lock our minds in this religion or in that religion, then we are in trouble. It is not that the religion may be wrong, nor is it true that the religion will not lead us there. But the moment we say this and no other will lead us there, or lead me there. We are then dogmatizing over something we do not understand. And we are not illumined, but heavily creed-bound uh, with certain dogmas that are forever getting in the way of our own growth. Therefore, we notice in the world several kinds of people. People who are very sure of everything and usually very uncomfortable unhappy, unadjusted. The individual who passes judgment continuously is one who has experienced little. The more we become acquainted with value, the less certain we become of anything except the ultimate fact of value. If we walk one path, it is the only path. But if we sincerely walk two paths, then there are two paths. We have experienced them. And if with a certain charity of consciousness we walk one path and wish well to another man who is walking another path nearby, then we share in a common understanding. But all paths walked by the righteous 
lead to righteousness. And it is not the path, but the one who walks it, that determines whether or not the goal shall be achieved. The worst religion in the world can lead the good man to heaven because it cannot corrupt the good man. And if it corrupts him or corrupts anyone, it is because they are weak, not because they are good. The, the true person cannot be deceived because he will take any symbol that is presented to him and interpret it in the term of truth. On the other hand, the truest symbol in the world presented to the person who does not have this understanding cannot reveal to him the fact. It is a very subtle thing, but it is something that every true seeker has to work with in his own experience. This experience of realizing that reality is everywhere and that the good man is ever near to it, regardless of what he believes. And the person who has bound himself by intellectual limitations is among the furthest from it. He is not as near as the simple aborigine or the small child. Because these others, the child and the aborigine, have directness, have simplicity, and have that kind of insight which is denied the person who has destroyed his own insight by artificial sophistication. So I think the lesson that Buddha teaches us on that point is very worthwhile and uh, has much to do with the achievement of well-being. Now there is another section in here which I also think uh, is very important, but we pass over it rather lightly and therefore I'd like to bring out certain additional material in relation to it. We mention in here the four caste systems as they were taught and understood in India. And we divide for this purpose of this meditation study uh, existence as we know it into four lokas or regions or guarded over by the four kings of the corners of the world that are called the lokapalas. These four regions are called the sacerdotal sphere, the administrative sphere, the economic sphere, and the sphere of crafts and trades. Now these are the four uh, castes of Hinduism. And this division, whether we recognize it or not, is not an arbitrary bit of Hindu theology. It is an obvious and inevitable division of society. A society which divides instinctively into levels. Now the growth of man in the course of ages has gradually resulted in the loss of clear lines of demarcations between these levels. There was a time when a man was born into one of these castes and in this he remained as long as he lived and his sons and their sons after him. But with the passing of time, the general elevation of the state of man has resulted in the human being inhabiting two or more of these castes simultaneously. He has not necessarily broken through the caste system, but he has achieved a status which enables him to be in more than one sphere of activity at one time. And also, to go back to the statement that we first made prior to this, namely these four states or conditions used to have very arbitrary religious and philosophical meanings. And it was assumed that only the Brahmin or the administrator could hope to attain to enlightenment. Buddha broke through this barrier with a tremendous crash in the 6th century BC. And while the times and uh, circumstances have shifted in Asia, the whole world has now also broken through this concept and has come to the final conclusion that due to the natural circumstances of living, average persons are arranged in these groups 
but that these groups are no longer walls or barriers. They are roads and bridges leading to a certain distinct and purposeful end. Perhaps the one of the most interesting points, for instance, is this uh, consideration of the fourth state, class, caste, or sphere, which we mention here as the sphere of the crafts and trades involving labor, production, also the agriculturist, the craftsman, the mechanic, and these phases of human life. Now, this is no longer what it used to be. Up to the 17th century of the Christian era in Europe, there was no difference in the words which stood for, which now stand for artist and artisan. The word artist, as we know it today, did not exist. That word is less than 300 years old as having any meaning apart from artisan. In other words, a man who was an artisan might put a good uh, sole on a pair of shoes. In the 16th century, he could be indiscriminately referred to as either an artisan or an artist. We had no division between these. In the development of folk arts and folk crafts today, the same situation presents itself. Some of our most marvelous creative activity today is on the level of crafts and arts rather than on the level of the great superior forms of knowledge that were once regarded as sublime. We are not at all sure today that there is any essential difference in art value between a little cup that was made by the tens of thousands by a Korean potter and the finest piece of Haviland China that you can buy. In fact, in, o in the Orient and among some European collectors, you can buy the most beautiful piece of Haviland China, oh, five hundred or a thousand dollars. Then you're really paying a high price for it. But for a little old crude Korean bowl that is almost shapeless and has just a little gla glaze dripping down one side, you may have to pay fifty thousand dollars. The first, the Havel in China, was designed by an artist. The bowl was made by an artisan. And at the present time, the work of the artisan is worth a hundred times the work of the artist. He is the greater artist. So therefore, you are not sure just what you're dealing with. And in this problem of the dividing of man into various levels, we come to this important philosophical fragment of insight, which I think we should know. Man is today largely a divided personality. In China, the idea of the transcendent being uh, multiplying itself, as described in this book, meant that, as in the story of Buddha, that when the time came uh, for the illumination of the world, Buddha multiplied himself and appeared simultaneously in the 33 worlds. By an extension of himself, therefore, he was present in the highest regions of the abstract universe and at the same time in the lowest, densest, and most troubled regions of Avicii or hell. He was immediately present everywhere by this mystery of the transcendent being. And it is also ref uh, referred in legend, at least, that during the so-called three days in the grave, Jesus went down into the underworld to re relieve the souls of the lost. This is still celebrated as part of the church rituals. So here we have man now, no longer a separate being, and no longer needing adjustment merely upon one level or plane but finding it increasingly necessary to render unto Caesar those things which are Caesar's in each of the spheres of his life. So today we have in the human being all of these elements combined in one. We have man the priest. We have man in this capacity as the great guardian of his own soul. We have man the administrator. Here, by wisdom and understanding, 
by learning and knowledge. He must lead the course of his own life. He must make the rational decisions. He must also engage with others in the common problems of leadership and administration. Then we have man as the worker in the sense of the economist. We have the man who must make a living, who must buy and sell, must exchange commodities, <coughs> must maintain the elaborate and involved structure of what we call the financial patterns under which we live. And even if these patterns should change sometime, still some pattern will be there, requiring adjustment uh, to the problems of mutual cooperation and effort for mutual survival. Then we have man the craftsman, the laborer, the builder, who must create in various ways all the things which he needs, either directly or indirectly. He must also have the creative instincts of making a better world. Here is your agriculturist who must uh, feed the world. Here are all the various lines of activity. And in symbolism, they can be in one person. They can represent the levels of his own nature. And as so representing these levels, they uh, terminate by causing a person to be more than one individual. He is bound together by a total consciousness, which to a measure determines the degree of relationship of all of these spheres of action to his own nature. But in his meditation and in his reflections, and in his practice of mystical disciplines, he cannot function solely on one level. If he does, he accomplishes a discord or a division within himself. He must find the synthesizing agent of his own understanding, and he must adjust himself properly, reasonably, and normally upon all levels. The individual who devotes his life to meditation and someone else has to work to supply him with bread is not the true person, he is not the true disciple. The individual who does not assume all of the reasonable duties which are involved in life, but thinks of spirituality as an evasion of these duties, or an escape from them, or that by holiness he shall escape the need for these adjustments. This person is following, of course, the old ascetic ideas of ancient Hinduism and even primitive Christianity. But he is not following the doctrine of the pure land. He is not following this concept that gradually took over, that the person has to bring all of himself into a kind of normal or proper integration. Integration must therefore be a fulfillment of the person rather than an effort of the person to escape from level to level to leave behind that which is unpleasant or uncomfortable in some region where adjustment has not been attained. If the person neglects his administrative faculties, he is in trouble. If, however, in the cause of administration he neglects his spiritual values, he is also in trouble. If in his search for inner understanding he ignores his economic responsibilities. He not only uh, creates a problem for himself, but loses the respect of his fellow men. And if in the various processes in which he is concerned, he does not make creative contribution, if he does not in some way or other make two blades of grass grow where one grew before, he is also being unfair to his world, and he is failing in that proper and orderly progress by means of which his nature will ultimately be brought to quietude. The end, of course, is quietude. And this quietude cannot come if the four unreconciled castes are constantly at war with each other. In the old Hindu system, the sudra or the slave 
was always resenting his superiors in class. The Brahmin was looking down upon the merchant. The warrior was looking down upon the agriculturist. And, of course, the agriculturist and the uh, lower type of mechanic had no direction to look except up, and there he saw nothing but his superiors. This was a, uh, not a proper attitude. Yet it is an attitude that can happen to us, not in just the same way, perhaps, but just as seriously. For all these old stories are symbolic accounts of values which have to be experienced and with which we must become gradually informed. The human being also, by natural instinct, has the attributes of the four castes. Now, instinct cannot be frustrated. Instinct must be unfolded until man discovers that the truth instinct is the energy behind all other instincts. Until he finds that out, he has not achieved. Therefore, it is not the frustration of instinct, but the normalization of it, by which, under proper condition, all instincts lead to that which is good, that which is proper, that which is next. Of course, one of our problems is that instincts may seem too slow for us. They only show us the next thing, when what we want is ten jumps ahead. This is, of course, unfortunate, because we cannot achieve uh, unless we take each step. The effort to escape or to jump across vast intervals without thoroughly grounding ourselves as we proceed will lead to the most dangerous spiritual accidents. Thus, the problem of the person is that he has a kind of fourfold personality, the elements of which must all find their own peace. The man who works with his hands or finds this part of his outlet must find peace in this work. He must find in it the gradual uh, experiencing of universals. When he weaves, or draws, or paints, or carves, or whittles, he is working toward universal creative expression. And as he finds the laws in his crafts and arts, he becomes more and more capable of adoring the master of laws. And therefore we have the ancient cults and secret societies and orders of artisans and architects and stonecutters. These were no longer simply building houses for princes and tyrants. They were chewing the stone of character for the glory of the eternal God. And as the old Essene masters of Syria felt that every time they built a house, they were bringing the sense of family and of home and of security and of value to human beings. Therefore, to build a house was an act of worship. To make a work of art is an act of worship. To produce something that is pleasant, beautiful, satisfying, these things are acts of worship. Man worships as he plants the seeds in the earth, just as much as he does before the altar of the church. And the same way in economics. And, of course, the history of the economic sphere is one of the rockiest in the entire history of man's experience. In many nations, particularly in some of the Far Eastern countries, the merchant is regarded as the lowest of all classes and has difficulty even surviving. But in, in the end, for some unexplained reason, the merchant ends up with everything. No matter whether he is despised or not, he ends up with the goods. He has a mysterious ability to survive. Now, merchandising we regard in many ways as a kind of of parasitical way of life. But under the conditions in which we live, with the tremendous diversification of products, the need of the transportation of products and the distribution of them through incredible areas, merchandising and the whole theory of economics has taken on a basic integrity. We have to have it. Therefore, we are no longer dealing with an evil unless it is abused. And the individual engaged in these projects has also the right to pride, the right to the recognition 
that through the distribution of these things necessary to man, he is contributing to the well-being of man. Now, it may well be that he makes a profit so doing. But if his primary pride is in the fact that he is serving a need, he may take a reasonable profit with honor. But if his only consideration is profit, and he merely grudgingly serves the world's need, then this individual is spiritually wrong. And if this person should by some means or circumstances decide to become religious, he must certainly correct this basic error in himself and his relationship to his world and his life. If he does not, he's in trouble. He does not mean that he has to give up his merchandise, but he has to revitalize the true motive behind value and have that motive first, and serve that motive first, with a realization that if he stands firmly upon his motive, those things which are otherwise necessary shall be added unto him. It is his motive. Is he in business because he believes that the world has a need which he must supply? If he has this basic conviction, and it is real, it will not interfere with his spiritual growth, but will advance it. But to have this conviction means that he must obey it, must vitalize it, and must sacrifice, if necessary, for it. But if his conviction is right, then the thing which he is doing is right. And he will then administer what he is doing honorably. The same is true in the administrative sphere or in the profession. We have the common problem that we think of so often of the doctor. If the primary motive of the doctor is the recovery of the patient, if he recognizes himself as a priest of the healing arts, and this is his primary consideration, he is entitled to what reasonable support he needs, for the workman is worthy of his hire. He is entitled to whatever is properly a reward for work well accomplished. He will be paid. It is a byproduct of work well done. But the primary motive in his own consciousness must sincerely and honorably be that he desires to devote his energy, his time, and his life to the service of the sick, that he may bring them back, if possible, to such health as may be possible by the knowledge which he possesses. His motive must be right. If it is so right, then it is also true of the diplomat, the politician, the statesman. These may advance to any condition that their honor may bring them to, so long as they do not dishonor their own honor. But that person who desires office merely for ambition is already wrong. And if that same person <coughs> should attempt some form of religious or spiritual training he can get nowhere until he corrects his own motive. And the same in the sacerdotal set. If the servant of God, the priest, the administrator, the minister, clergyman, if these persons have as their primary end the service of God and their fellow man, then their way is indicated. And they are entitled to that which is necessary for them to be able to supply that need as effectively and as joyously and as pleasantly as possible. But if this motive is not right, if our theologian is merely a church politician, then this individual is deprived of all religious insight by that circumstance alone. He cannot know the real now, we may not be chosen to such a great decision as this, but in each walk of life, in whatever we are doing, if our motive is not instinctively right, it is then instinctively wrong. Now, we can live comparatively well with a comparatively inadequate motive. We can drift along, as millions have before us, from the cradle to the grave, and our motives will be responsible only for gradual hardening of the arteries. But, if in this way of life 
we suddenly develop a yen for religion. Suddenly we decide to be spiritual. And we begin this difficult path of trying to find out what truth is and how we could attain to it. Then these motives stand as guardians by the gate. Like the, uh, like the scowling lion dogs. With their strange intuition, they cannot be deceived. And the individual striving to go on is blocked entirely by the general pattern of his own inadequate motive. So the need constantly to make sure that as we dedicate ourselves to something better, that we have cleaned house, that these motives upon which so much depends have themselves been properly cleansed. For if they have not, we are in trouble. These motives, extending into many spheres of life, bring with them all that they imply, and uh, we cannot escape them at any time. If then, to go on a little further in our book, uh, you will find the little story here about the deal art dealer with the lacquer box that was made long ago by an artisan. I saw the box in Kyoto when I was there, and it had a little tray in it, and the tray rested inside the box, and uh, you put the tray in the box, and it, it fitted perfectly, and seemed like the upper tray of a trunk or something of that nature. It rested flush with the top of the box, but the dealer put his hand in the center of the tray and pressed down on it, and the tray went down. He lifted his hand, the tray came back up again. The tray was floating on air. The lacquer fitted so perfectly that the tray floated on the air pressure. Now, this was made a long time ago. It was made of wood. Certainly, it had been beautifully lacquered. But this wood had gone through expansion and contraction for a hundred years, and still the tray fitted perfectly. And as this little man told me, and he's involved is one of the characters that fit together to make the personality of Mr. Nakamura. This little man told me, he said, this is what we call work with insight. This is another dimension of integrity. For the way to spiritual understanding, the way to self-unfoldment is the way of a kind of quiet dignity in which the individual is incapable of ever doing less than his best. It just doesn't appear to him conceivable that he could. The way of haste, the way of imperfect workmanship, the way of indifference to labor, the way of indifference to problem, the way of indifference to anything, the easy way, the quick way, the cheap way. These can have no place in the consciousness of this person search, searching for enlightenment. For if he has this at one extremity of his consciousness, he will never have integrity at the other. It's simply impossible. He can never rise out of his own compromise until inwardly he experiences the impossibility of further compromise. He must do it right. Therefore, to love God on the one hand and do a sloppy job on the other, these are incompatible. These tear the individual apart psychically. Now, it might seem that this doesn't mean too much, but as the great dragon is said to be the result of many little dragons, so the great disaster is always the result of innumerable little disasters, and the most terrible of small disasters is compromise. So the person learns that the way of self-unfoldment is a way of completeness. We are seeking to become complete. We must therefore think and live and feel with all intent that all things shall be as perfect, as beautiful, as possible, in order that 
In this way, we may offer a peculiar symbol, the symbol of our own dedication to value, and that this offering is the one most acceptable in the sight of the Most High. Therefore, we come to the substance of our main thought of the evening, and that is the elements which go to make up the nature of this transcendent being, which is nothing more or less than our transcendent selves. It is our self seen with honor. It is the individual who honestly and sincerely and without pride and with factual certainty can look into himself and say, here is a fellow that is really making a good try. A little dangerous to say that the, here's a fellow that's good, but it is perfectly permissible to say that here is someone that is sincerely and honestly making a good try that everything possible in the life is being brought into a pattern of value, of integrity. Not for the sake of becoming spiritual, but because actually it is only this unity of value that can make a person happy, make him contented, make him able to live conveniently and comfortably with himself. This person can go to sleep with a good conscience and can wake up into a world of wonders where there are more things to be done. The person who has this attitude cannot be bored and can never find an uninteresting universe, nor can he ever dedicate his total attention to some useless and meritless purpose. We have values coming through to waste time is to waste value. But to use time desperately is to waste time. All things must have their rightness and their properness. And out of this gradual integration on the four levels of the castes, the four levels of our own contemplative existence, extending through every phase of our activity, personal and collective, individual and universal, that gradually comes into integration, nothing exceptional, because as uh, Daruma in the Zen points out, the end of all growth is that we shall not have something exceptional, because something exceptional is like a thorn or a horn sticking out somewhere for something to uh, stumble over. We are not seeking to be exceptional. We do not regard reality as exceptional. We would rather say the person who lives badly is exceptional. We want to take the ground that the normal is not in any way an exception, but that most people live by a law which is an exception to the normal. So we, what we wish to produce in the end is not a person worthy to be a god, or a person who has risen triumphantly above the consciousness of his neighbors. What we are trying to produce out of all of this is an individual of simple, normal, reasonable, orderly attitudes. One who means what he says and says what he means, and at the same time is instinctively gentle and instinctively kind one who is able to estimate through things into the value within them and behind them, who, when he speaks, thinks not only of what he wants to say, but of the capacity of his listener to understand, who achieves all things in a proper, gracious, gentle manner. This person is now no longer psychic, stress-ridden. He is quiet. He is orderly. He is composed. He has achieved that integration by means of which he is in a relationship with universal life that is real. He has obeyed all things according to the law of his own being and of the law of universal being. 
The reward of this simple adjustment is rapport with reality. This person experiences reality. He experiences it either in meditation or through discipline because there is no conflict to destroy it. There is no illusion to tear it up. The individual very quietly also experiences reality simply and humbly. He is not in the midst of some fantastic experience which he wishes to tell all his friends. The things that come upon him come quietly as a small voice speaking in the night. The truth comes in without fanfare, without tremendous announcement of itself. The, the values simply operate because man permits them to operate. And when the individual ceases to be his poorest self, he becomes his divine self. You, he cannot train or condition or unfold or educate the transcendent being any more than he can instruct God on how to run the universe. Actually, the only thing he can do is to train, educate, and control those phases of himself by which the transcendent being is inhibited and prevented from functioning. So the individual who removes his own errors stands in the face of truth. For he is never divided by truth, uh, from truth by anything but his own mistake, his own wrong psychological integration. But how powerful this wrong integration can be can be attested by the fact that it has burdened man since the beginning of known time. Man has fought for this reality since the dawn of recorded history and long before. And only a handful have found it. Because in a very few instances has the individual actually been able to break through the illusion which he has created around his own conduct. He has not been able to be simple. He has not been able to be straight. He has not been able to be kind. He has not been able to get selfishness, self-purpose, and self-will out of the compound of his own nature. And he has suffered and died from these since the dawn of things. But it is not necessary that it be so. Because for each individual there must be ultimately this awakening. This awakening into the beauty of the individual who is the gardener because he simply loves the roses. That there is no other value involved. That that, that is, which is what he wants to be. And if his desire to be real is greater than his desire to be something that is not real, he will achieve. And his achievement will be the beginning of all of the good things which he seeks. It is wrong to seek the good things first. The scripture tells us the correct order beyond doubt. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and its righteousness and all these other things shall be added unto you. Most people start seeking for all the other things first. Therefore, the kingdom of righteousness is not experienced. It's never found. But if man seeks that first which is first, the result of this direct, simple achievement is that everything else that is necessary is immediately there. But if sought for its own sake, these other things, or this other thing, will never actually be found. The transcendent being is therefore actually the archetypal integration, the normalcy, the quiet meditating figure seated in the heart, which by its own extension can move itself not only into any part of the body, but into any part of the mind and the soul, the emotions, the consciousness, that this transcendent nature is what it is simply because it transcends that which is less than itself. And this transcending 
means that by value and power and purpose and substance, it is superior. And this superior being is always represented in one of these quiet postures. The superior being never waves a flag, never rides off in triumph, never receives the plaudits of the multitude. The superior being never senses itself as giving orders and announcing its decisions or passing judgments, or criticizing or condemning. The transcendent being is always represented in this highly meditative, uh, highly mystical relationship with life. It is that which exists only in its own nature. It exists in the supreme quietude of things. Not a quietude from sound alone, but a quietude from stress. When so experienced within, it is a self made available. It is the northern Buddhistic idea of the redeemed self. It is not the final nirvanic nature, because nirvana and the paranirvana goes, uh, go far beyond this point. But this is the self that merits heaven. This is the self for which the western paradise of Amitabha was brought into existence. This is the self that shall abide in the blessed regions of Sukravati. Here is the self that goes on to peace, to rest, and to hope. Now, Buddha, as many of the other sages, pointed out, much as Plato did, that this land of the blessed to which the individual goes if he has led the good life may or not be a, pl be a place at all. The land of the blessed could be right here where he lives now. The land of the blessed could be the old world of contention that he once could get nowhere with. The land of the blessed is simply all things seen through the eye of order. It is the doubt and the fear and the hurt taken out of every situation. And when these things are taken out, nothing remains except value. And this value is lesson or learning or experience, all of them blessed qualities. So the land of the blessed is simply anywhere where a person who is at peace with himself finds himself because no condition can take this away from him. The universe is blessed to those who have beheld its purpose. Those who know the reason for things, quietly, gently, and lovingly bow to that reason and give thanks. It is the one who does not know that forever fights and struggles and dies in the desperate effort to live. So the, the quiet nature of the transcendent being views all life, whether in this region or any other region, with the moderate contemplation, uh, which is, however, not cold and not detached. Much has been said concerning how the transcendent nature shall view that which it once experienced in pain, or in turn shall view that which it shall experience in joy. Shall the transcendent nature say, oh, goody, goody? Shall the transcendent nature give thanks? There is the story of the good soul, the transcendent nature that was rewarded after death by being transported into the paradise of Indra. After this good being who had been a good king and ruled his people wisely and lovingly, had remained in the paradise of Indra for some time enjoying everything, he said to himself, My, I must have been a good king to deserve this. And instantly he fell into the lowest regions of perdition. <laughs> so that the mind again determines the mystery of the transcendent being. According to the uh, esoteric me metaphysics relating to this, the consciousness of the tra transcendent being to life to that which it has known, to that which it hopes to know, is not cold, 
It is not viewing all things as some gray dream. It is not giving thanks that at last it is free. It is not even hoping for freedom. It is simply experiencing a strange, quiet warmth, which Buddha refers to as compassion. He refers to it as a kind of love emotion, which is not an ardency such as we know it, but is the quiet love of truth, the love of reality, the, the joy of the parent beholding joy in the eyes of the child. It is the simple a directness. Behold, it is good. And in this directness, a prayerful faith, a constant internal recognition that is always warm and always wonderful because to the true uh, truth seeker who has found the transcendent being, all things are forever wonderful. Wonderful simply because the mystery of the divine purpose and of the divine nature. This mystery goes on and on. And everywhere it is wonderful if we have the eyes to see and the hearts to understand. If we do not, it is all terrible. So the transcendent being that has found peace has also found the wonder of the small child that opening its eyes into a new world sees everything wonderful filled with hope and aspiration, no longer of immaturity, but still of childlikeness. The child that accepts with gladness the reality and goes on, fully convinced that it is being properly and definitely guided in a universe in which there are no mistakes, no errors, and no deceits. All these things have to come they come slowly and gradually and wonderfully. But this great journey, as Buddha says, begins with the first faltering step. And each person who wishes to escape from the smallness that hurts him must gradually achieve the greatness which sets him free. And this greatness is this greatness of simple, direct acceptances and dedications that are so natural so inevitable that we only make these moves because we can't help making them. Why we can stop ourselves, we have not attained. Because when the time is really right for us to embrace the truth, we do so simply because we cannot help it. It is the only thing we want to do. And this must mean that other desires less commendable have gradually been transmuted by the mysteries and processes of life. Thus we gradually build a new self, a self which can be free from body and inhabited, a self which can ride upon the gay birds of heaven like the Taoist immortals, a self that in the body still is free, and that yet free is forever true to the needs of the body which it occupies a soul free of life, but ever mindful of life, a soul that inhabits space, but can at the same time lovingly comprehend the mystery of time. For that which we grow out of, we always leave behind with love. That which we try to walk out of, we may leave behind with hate. But what we outgrow, we also understand. And with infinite patience, we can regard that which was once our own, but which is no longer our own. So by degrees, this transcendent self emerges as the product of this total realization, a realization that touches, moves, changes every atom of our beings. Well, I guess the time is up, so we'll see you again a week from the next.